Welcome to the Meltzone Podcast from August 19th, 2021. This is episode 50. I'm Tom. And I'm Stefan. And on this almost like celebratory... And unfortunately, I'm going to have to do the rest of the uh, topics intro because Stefan's internet is breaking up. We do have one or two hitches throughout this episode, but it's not that bad, I, I promise. Um, we also talk about uh, Sheetu boxes or Sheetu Box Pro, Sheetu Box, and Sheetu's lockdown of the Elegoo Mars 3 and possible future SLA resin printers, as well as two really cool printed add-ons or a 3D printer that's that's built from scratch. Uh, the first one is the 3D colorizer um, that uses Sharpies to fill in your white print and makes it a multicolor print, essentially. And the second one is a full scratch built upside down 3D printer and all the upsides <laughs> all, all the upsides that has uh, when it comes to uh, how 3D printer geometry should be working. And lastly, a quick note about uh, the Fusion 360 STL 2 solid geometry feature and what it can and cannot do. Stefan, you look you look different today. What happened to your studio, man? Yeah, my, my studio moved to the outside. It actually moved to Italy for today. <laughs> ah, nice. Or for actually the whole the whole week first vacation in two years uh it feels great on the one hand and still like currently being uh, in like touristy places feels kind of weird yeah but that i'm basically true, yeah. on vacation yeah are you, are you stressing out much about oh i'm not getting anything done <laughs> have, you, have you moved um, past that yes a bit but uh, basically i had to get over that at some point because um even though well in the past i always had a bit of time to do to do research and and stuff like that but well now having a baby with us uh being on yeah. vacation means like spending the whole day with the with a family and it it was even kind of hard to uh kind of find this this two hour slot for recording this podcast but um yeah since yeah. since we didn't manage to record the podcast before like yeah we drove to um southern tirol um i thought yeah maybe maybe we can find something and uh try out recording in a different place today <laughs> yeah the 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 ambience is pretty nice uh, so you got yeah. some, some birds chirping in the background yeah, and of course the video looks a bit bad for for all of you watching on YouTube. But okay, Stefan still looks, it, he, he still looks fine. He, you know, he always <laughs> looks good in, in any camera and lighting situation. So that always works. Well, I tried I tried activating HDR on my like kind of expensive Logitech Brio camera, but didn't change anything. That's so, a yeah. that's a Brio. Okay, wow. I'm okay. No, I'm I'm using those too. That's that's what uh, Stefan is seeing me through right now. But. Okay. Uh, I wow. Honestly, okay. I'm not 100% sure if this is a, a, a fake Brio that I got because even like in in my normal studio at home, it it doesn't look as good as I would expect for a 150 euros USB uh, camera. Yeah, that, I mean that they used to be a lot more expensive. Like they did come down in price. I I, I find them okay like they're, they're, they're claiming 4k and everything it's like yeah it's 4k mm. but the lens doesn't really do 4k um they're fine they, of course if you put them next to a, to a dslr like that, that's not a competition <laughs> but they're, they're pretty much the best webcam you can get i think yeah no i right. actually bought it for just like a, a secondary or a tertiary camera for like live streams in the future i, st I still have my unassembled prusa mini kit on my desk ah. at home which i have to assemble hopefully next week or the week after that right so upping my game to maybe at some point look well i i wouldn't say similar to your stuff but at least in a way uh, decent <laughs> yeah yeah well more more angles is always better um i'm using one two three four hdmi cameras so i mean you know into a capture card and stuff mm -hmm. so webcam I, I tried using the webcams for a while but it's just you have it, it's more reliable and consistent to, to go with these eyes it also costs 10 times as much but yeah you do what you gotta do we'll see i i don't know if i'm gonna regret it um afterwards yeah but 
So new setup for today, um, Southern or Süd Tirol, where we are currently at, where you basically can't find any bad food. Uh, yeah. The weather is great. Uh, we were hiking. We are in a nice hotel. You can actually see my my personal like whirlpool in the background, which is <laughs> which is wood fired. <laughs> yeah. Oh, that, does that thing catch on fire? I hope not. Well, uh, I hope that that this thing doesn't catch on fire because we're basically sleeping uh, sleeping next to it. But yeah, you like put uh, 1,000, 2,000 liters of water in there. Then you have a, a wood stove in there. Fire it like three hours before you yeah. want to jump in. And then you have a nice 40 degrees Celsius bath. <laughs> it really feels so like my last big holiday was when we were in Japan and I that really feels enjoyed. Like it was yesterday. It feels like you it just talked about that. It's like, oh, yeah. where, where did the time go? Time flies by. Uh, it was uh, so. Uh, yeah, I, I Google always sends you like uh, memories yeah. from the past. Today, it sent me a picture when we were in Kyoto like two years ago. So it was just really like two years ago today. Uh, so, but to get back to the topic, so one really interesting Japanese tra tradition are the onsen, which are the like hot baths, uh, which are at first you think yeah, you're going to boil in there, but they have their thermal um, water sources where they get right. really nice and hot water, which they're using in their bathhouses. And this is kind of similar because like on the first day we went in there, I'm quite sure that the water temperature was way above 40 degrees celsius and <laughs> so my wife couldn't stay in there for like longer than five minutes i made it like 10 or 15 minutes and then i jumped into the <laughs> pool at night just to cool down a little bit yeah it's, it's really relaxing i i seriously enjoy it a lot and especially just like thinking of the time before now my holiday started i was really burned out i wasn't motivated anymore to do yeah. like to make videos and stuff like that because so much stuff was going on and this is just like one week for me now where i can slow down a little bit think about everything which has been going on during the last time and hopefully start with a new and free and clean mind in uh yeah into the next projects yeah um you, you didn't listen to podcasts a lot um from from what i from what i understand but uh, one of my inspirations for for why i wanted to start a podcast in the first place is uh, methodisch incorrect um podcast about german podcasts so for all of you english speakers unfortunately uh, you're not going to get much out of that but a german podcast with uh, two now phds uh one professor one phd if i'm correct yeah um and they they do like three hour podcasts, which I I mean <laughs> we're burned out after ninety minutes, and they the, each time they they do like four uh, papers. They they talk about um, each 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 one of them uh, prepares two papers and basically presents it to the other one, and, and they discuss it and, and all that. It's it's a lot more casual than it sounds like. And one of the papers that they that they did I think a year or two ago was about uh, vacation and how it actually affects you psychologically and that it's not mm -hmm. just the vacation it's not just the being away for two or three weeks and and being outside of your your regular you know nine to five uh, rhythm but it's it's also the the anticipation of going on vacation already gets you in a better mood and already relaxes mm -hmm. you because you know you're going to get that break then then mm -hmm. you have the vacation itself and then afterwards you also get the i don't want to say the afterglow but um you have uh, you have memories that you can uh, jump back to, and that's that. On top of that, gives you another level of um, well, peace and and uh, chill out of this. So yeah, yeah. The only problem I usually only have with vacations, even though vacations might be really relaxing, like the last day when you're driving home or flying home or just getting back to your home, is often. Just like that stressful that fifty percent of the relaxation you had before is 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 gone again, or at least you feel it at that day. Hey, but but even um, if it's fifty percent, like it's still that's still a good amount of relaxation you've got. <laughs> still fifty percent left. Yeah. No, to be totally honest, honest, I I wouldn't be able to like stay here for for weeks 
because I would just be bored. I'm, I'm looking forward to get back home. Um, but still being on uh, kind of even a forced, forced vacation because, uh, I don't have a lot of things to work with me. So the only thing I had with me to work is like the camera and the microphone. <laughs> Yeah. yeah and we're doing like a two-hour recording wife, session today so yeah, yeah and even my wife suggested yeah uh since you guys didn't 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 succeed in recording before before we left uh why don't you take your like your microphone with you and maybe we can find a two-hour spot to do that but so yeah. yeah so yeah it's really yeah nice. uh, the vacation it it does need to be vacation it shouldn't just be oh i'm i'm taking my work somewhere else that doesn't work no yeah. no it doesn't and days fly by here so fast so as i said yeah you wake up in the morning have a relaxed breakfast then you go hiking or something like that and when you're back home maybe there's still time for a coffee but then there's already dinner prepared and since we're not partying at night it's already time for bed again <laughs> yeah i mean you got nothing to do right that's you've, no, you've got nothing definitely. you have to do so that's that's nice but what we have to do today is just to get into some topics. Um, we, we, we don't just want to get you all envious about uh, how, how chilled out Stefan is right now. I mean, <laughs> I, I can hear it in your voice. You've, you've got a very laid back so, tone today. Yeah. The, the baby is sleeping next to me. And my wife told me if she's able to, to hear me through the, like the baby phone, uh, she's going to scream angrily at me. <laughs> oh, so okay. I have to cal I have to calm down. <laughs> A little bit. What we should also talk about on this podcast is today's sponsor. Future Tom, remember to put some music behind this. <laughs> yeah, so today's just like staying on the topic of, of resin 3D printing. Today's video sponsor is Druckwege. Druckwege is, is a German company that develops and also manufactures high quality 3D printing resins. Their resins are partly especially developed for for well they are specially developed for model makers research and development and even small series production where a good quality resin with repeatable products and, and parts in the end is very important and um, also something that might be really important if you would think about integrating their resins into your company is uh, that they have proper safety data sheets and also um, their products are isha isha registered they got two series of resins they have like a D-series of resins, which is for DLP printers um, and other LCD resin 3D printers. And they also have S-type resins, which are for SLA 3D printing systems. So mostly uh, the Formlabs printers. And does Pio Poly also have a I believe SLA so. System? I believe that the, the Moai is laser-based, yeah. Yeah. I believe so. No, don't quote me on that. <laughs> yeah, so that's that, that's that's a great option to have uh, from a German company. Um, you can get lots of resins, um, imports, and you know you don't always know what you're gonna get exactly. Safety data sheets might be missing. Uh, they're fine for like printing basic stuff. Usually they're fine for printing stuff at home. But if you need something that is repeatable, that is usable in a professional environment, um, give Druckwege a a consideration. Check them out at the link below in the show yeah. notes or on YouTube in the video description. Thank you, Druckwege, for yes, sponsoring this episode of the podcast. Thank you very much. One, one of the cool things that we saw, um, Helen uh, reposted that Repcord um, for their podcast, for Hot Makes. Ha -ha, we're, we're, we're stealing our topics. Ha ha ha. Mark Th 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 Therold. At Partially Frozen uh, posted a really nice uh, stop motion animation of a, of a Benchy swimming through waves. Um, just something cool that we found, something cool that I think is is a really, it's a, it's an awesome application of 3D printing. It's a Benchy yeah. that is, it looks like it's the same Benchy between every frame, but then the um, the base that, you know, it it looks like it's riding through mm -hmm. the water is animated under the Benchy. That's a fresh print every frame. And it's like, yeah, how many frames is that? 
Well, if Probably. you follow the link um, and take a look at the Twitter thread, you can see like two Prusas printing the the wavy part, and it looks as if there are around a hundred frames. No, maybe not. Maybe fifty frames. Yeah, fifty, yeah, 50 frames 50 of animation right. for the wavy motion. That's that's quite impressive. Yeah, the thing I would be interested in is how he approached well like animating it in in the first place because you need to have some kind of a i wouldn't say wave simulation but some kind of a wave animation and then even probably in blender or wherever he did it uh, um, place the banshee because there are cutouts for the one Benji that he's using for the animation in each of those like wave yeah. tiles. Yeah. Um, yeah, I, I guess, guess. Yeah, it, it would. It would. I mean, that that must be a full fluid simulation. It's just is there is there a way to like export a whole animation as individual frame STLs? I mean, you, you can you can generate that object that wave object in Blender mm -hmm. directly. Um, but do, do you, you do basically need to go through and export every single frame, I guess. Yeah. Which is a bit I, tedious, but doable. Well, if it's just 50 frames, I, I think animators are doing way worse stuff. Um, yeah. I don't know how he did it. I suppose, well, if, if I would need to do something like that with my non-knowledge of, of uh, 3D animation, I would basically get that uh, animated water from somewhere and then just frame by frame move the bench a little bit and and simulate how it goes through the water because i think like doing a real physics simulation of of a bench going through the water might be way more effort than just doing yeah 50 yes. animation frames by hand especially if you want the bench well i guess you could constrain it if you want to stay the bench in the center of that frame um yep. Yeah, I guess for for the effect, either one could work. You could keyframe it. Mm. Um, you could just manually animate it, or you could you could actually. It it looks really good. Like it looks really um, believable mm -hmm. in the way that it moves through the waves. Uh, there is no there is no two yeah <laughs> shout out two minute papers. Uh, there is no two way coupling, so the, the it doesn't look like the bench is actually um, producing any waves itself, yeah. any ripples. Um, but yeah, the the, the water does look to to influence the benchy yeah. but yeah just cool stuff you find cool stuff that is that is being done with 3d printing um i guess i guess one level up is if you printed a negative of the wave pattern and then cast that into like a clear blue resin mm. that would have been <laughs> that would have been spectacular <laughs> yeah um, or you just print it out in resin in the first place True, true. You can do that. <laughs> uh, yeah, yeah. I guess I guess you could get a clear blue resin and just print it straight up, and that yeah. takes us perfectly to the next topic that we've got lined up. Um, Such a good segue. Oh, we're getting good at this. Um, the Mars Three. So uh, my Mars Three review is going to come out next week, as of when we're recording this. Um, so. Mar I actually, actually, I put it, I put the Mars Three and the original Mars side by side, and the the difference in how much bigger the screen has gotten is is quite significant. Mm -hmm. um, it doesn't look like it because every time a new generation comes out, it's like, well, we, we're doing like ten percent larger, but it does add up. It does add up. So um, yeah, the Mars Three, it's a good printer. The previous Mars were all good printers. Um, but they all, and not just not just the Elgo machines, but also stuff from Anycubic, from Creality, from Longer, from uh, who's making the Photon machines? Is it Anycubic? I don't know. It's Anycubic. Anycubic oh, Photon. Yeah. Okay, yeah, 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 you're right. Um, not the Prusa S1. They're using their own firmware, and I think there might be one or two others that use their own stuff. But um, all those cheaper machines, they all use the Shito ecosystem. And we've touched on that before, I think. Um, Shito make the firmware, the main boards, the masking screens, and the slicer um, for those printers. So basically, the manufacturer just buys those components, um, builds a box around it, puts the ZXs onto it, um, and uh, you know, adds a, adds a, adds a resin wrap, basically and everything else is already done for them. 
So now that she two have released their she two box paid subscription slicer uh, for 170 bucks a year, um, it should be a surprise that they decided to well, kind of lock their system down. Um, we don't know how locked down exactly it's going to be, but uh, the Mars 3, as far as I'm aware, does not accept any files sliced by anything else other than Sheetu Box. So Sheetu Box or Sheetu Box Pro is the only things that can slice for the Mars 3. Now, yeah? Yeah, continue. Yeah. I, I think you already wanted to to, <laughs> to address one of the solutions that they're suggesting. Yeah, so um, Sheetu have, so of course, I mean, this, uh, it is, look, it is quite a limitation only being to only being able to use one single slicer. Though, really, the only thing a an SLA slicer, from what I know, I mean, I'm not an SLA expert. Ask Uncle JC if you want, want more specialized stuff about that. Um, from what I'm aware, the only thing that an SLA slicer really needs to do well is add supports, and you can add supports in any software and uh, export it over to an STL again and print that in any program you want. So even with G2 Box Basic, you could still generate supports in Prusa Slicer or Lychee Slicer, I think, also exports, um, and then just slice it in the basic version and not pay for anything. But what uh, G2 are, su are suggesting is they're going to release an SDK that basically allows other software to um, to export into the proprietary and signed or encrypted uh, CBD format, C CTB, CT something. And that would allow other software to also print on uh, the Mars 3 and other future printers that are locked down. Yeah. But that basically requires Prusa, Prusa Slicer and any other slicers to integrate that SDK into their software. Yeah. Which... I don't know, can be a pain, is at least additional effort. And um, the question is, why? Because the yeah. other formats were also already working. Because uh, th the only thing that the printer is getting are like the uh, the PNG images for each layer and, and information, okay, how long is the exposure time? And then a yeah. couple of parameters, how, how far the, the thing that moves. So. You, you could as, run as the, the ZXs on, on G-Code and just say, okay, here's move up, down with your feed rates and then G-Code for load this image and show it for this long. Like, yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah, so that, that is that is kind of a point that is tricky to address because, like, why would they lock it down and then fully open it up again? Like, I mean, wh one of the things that I can guarantee is that that SDK is not going to be open source um, because, like, why why provide something and, and lock, lock it down and then you give the keys back out? Um, yep. So it's going to be a closed proprietary piece of software that um, an open source tool like Prusa Slice is going to have a, a tough time integrating. So it would be like, a, you know, load this module after the fact, after the install or something. Um, and also what I'm kind of worrying about is like what sort of limitations is that SDK going to bring? Um, so in my in my Elgur review, I'm, I'm, I'm listing those same ones like is it going to require the slicer to not do specific things like to be bad at supports or to mm. i don't know um, limit other features is the sdk going to be able to like fully address the printer and control the printer like is the peel cycle going to be speed limited or is mm. there going to be a brightness limit on the screen or some other mm. inconvenience um and is the sdk even going to be free is that also going to be a subscription option that that you then have to pay for instead of uh, Sheet the Box Pro? Like, I mean, we've seen stuff like that before. Yo, um, or are you only going to get the SDK if you have the Pro version of Sheet the Box? Because exactly, yeah. Which would I mean, the Sheet the Box Pro? If you open that up, it already has the login and you know online requirements um, to be to be working and all. And I would expect the SDK to do sort of the thing, oh, sort of the same thing. And even if it, so the, the other thing is also, even if we, we get an SDK that we say works for now, like she does still have control of the entire ecosystem. They can yeah. still do whatever they want. Um, because I mean, the, the SDK really, it, it's still a, a she to software. It, it's still a she to that, um, that make that, that provide it and they can take that back at any time especially if it's a if it's an online always version they can at, at any point yank the plug and say oh well this sdk is uh uh well, 
pronunciation of stuff that you only read online deprecated depreciated uh, not supported anymore and it's going to stop working going to have to update to the newest one okay. which is feature limited or requires a, a subscription or something so mm -hmm. they still have full control which is I, I don't know so that begs the question are they only doing it to make money with their she2 pro version or are there any like arguments where you that you could bring up that makes such a move feasible is it adding safety for the user not uh using i don't know wrong settings for the leds or the lcd i, I don't know that, stuff like that would still be done in firmware like the printer firmware would still handle safety features that's not a job of the slicer no. uh I, I honestly I don't see any move that that would be like oh we're just trying to uh, to do something good for the user we're trying to protect the user or something it's mm -hmm. nah nah that's that's the job of the printer itself mm. uh, really it is it is just about keeping control of their ecosystem mm -hmm. and they're trying to cling to that at at any cost it looks like. Yeah. So what I do not know though is could you reflash um, the controller on the um, on the printer on the printer mainboard? Mm. So the uh, the Mars three uses ah uh, is it? It's probably it's it's an STM thirty two. If uh, as far as I remember, it's right over there. I keep looking at it, but the lid isn't open. Mm -hmm. um, it's an F STM thirty two F one, I believe. Uh, the the good old F one hundred three. Or is it an F4? I don't know. It's it's some STM32. I don't know if those have like a lock feature where, where it's like you flash it once and then it only accepts uh, signed firmwares. Mm -hmm. Could have that. I don't know. Um, but like obviously if you could r relatively easily reflash uh, the printer then that entire lock thing, lock in mm. tie in feature is, uh, is kind of pointless. So I don't know. Again, Sheet Box basic still works and you can still import uh, pre-processed STLs into sheet box basic mm -hmm. but it's like an unnecessary uh, it, it's unnecessary hoops you have to jump through yeah. yeah it's I don't know you have followed I I guess you have followed this dis discussion a little bit closer than than I have from I guess our last podcast the one before because I think after that they released a statement where they said okay um, still anybody will be able to use their own sliced models on the machine and the <laughs> I, I sure hope so <laughs> <laughs> and the most recent one which is like eight days old now says yeah we do have now this closed ctb format um, and everyone will still be in the future able to create those files using our SDK. So this is already like locking it down one step further. Yeah. And I don't know, do you have you with your review, have you tried out if your Mars 3 is already locked from accepting um, sliced files from Prusa Slicer, for example? I would believe so. So I have not I've not tried. Um, but uh, if you look at, for example, Litchi Slicer, um, the, the Mars 3 is not in the compatibility list um, for Litchi Slicer, mm -hmm. so it stops at the Mars 2 Pro or something. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, yeah, that's the that's the status. Okay, so this was basically something that was introduced with the Mars 3, and with people could also fear yeah. this with a firmware upgrade for their, I don't know, current printers that currently still accepts files from other slicers that with a firmware upgrade this could be locked in the future it could be though i don't i mean it would be a pretty asshole move to take away features on on uh, on older printers as well and yeah. i mean firmware updates on an sla printer is not something you you really need to do like there's not much <laughs> to upgrade there um but they they could bring the they could bring the lock into to older printers as well mm. um and also to, to note there used to be a different file format it was like DLP CBD or something, um, six mm -hmm. letter <laughs> file extension. Um, that one was basically the zip file with PNGs in there. Um, okay. The CBD format has been around for a while. 
and it so far the tools worked to write to that format and sorry mountain road <laughs> uh, um, so far that format was as far as I understand was able to be written with um, like the, the tools that would take a push mm -hmm. slicer output and write it into that format um, or yeah. with uh, Lichy Slicer so okay. there's there's some there's something in that format that is now making it uh, encrypted signed in a way where only she to software can write it where where, okay. where, where only sh files written with she to software will be accepted by mm -hmm. the printer let's let's put it that way okay yeah let's let's see if like the same changes will also happen with the latest the latest SLA printers from I don't know Creality any Creality <laughs> Creality any cubic and uh, I yeah and also the other so, ones. Yeah. Um, yeah. Anyway, one one last note on the on the statement that was uh, that was published by Elegoo. Um, that was pretty much a a non statement. Like it's it's as little of a of of it has no new information in it, right? Mm -hmm. um, it's just saying hey, there's going to be an SDK and. Yeah, not, none of the questions were really answered. And that was the, the state <laughs> or the, the information we had about weeks ago already. Okay. Yeah. So m maybe let also the viewers from your next week's video know if that's if that's already the case, if, if your MOS3 is really only accepting <laughs> the CTB files. I would be interested to know that. Uh, yeah, to actually test it out. I've, I've not actually tested it. The video is already being edited, so uh, I won't be able to, to add much to that video anymore. Okay. We, we, we could talk about that on the next podcast. <laughs> yeah. Let's see. What's what's our next one? Oh, yeah. The, the Upside Down 3D Printer. Moving out of resin topics. Ha. <laughs> upside Down 3D Printer. So I've, I, I, I first saw that and I was like, well, it's a, it's a printer that was... Very, flip upside down like of course it's gonna work it's something that's not really intuitive because you, you like expect the filament to flow out of the nozzle and to like lay down onto your print but that's not how filament printers work no. they actually work by physically forcing your filament your extruded filament into the previous layer so yeah this is a project by uh krillin 3d that name rings a bell I think I think I'm following, following on Twitter, but yeah, um, a foldable upside down 3D printer, and it's it's got it, it's not just the fact that it's upside down. I think that the upside down is kind of the, the the hook, the tagline, but it's also the way that the printer was built. That upside down is just a better solution. So you've you've watched the video too, right? Yes, I have watched the video. Do you do you mean with the way the printer is built, like how it's built mechanically, or yeah. what the reason behind of all that was? Well, because isn't that like the same thing? Well, the re I think the reason behind building this printer was because this guy wants to have a printer that is easily portable, right? So easily right. foldable, re repeatedly like folded up again into into the normal printing orientation and like the normal prusa i3 style 3d printers are not, not that really. well made for that task yeah. of course if you take a look at if you have ever unboxed a, a cr10 or something like that or an endo3 sure you screw in the gantry and um if if all the plugs are in you you are ready to go but um this design is it, it, it's upside down and, and really intelligent and uh, really well made. Yeah, I don't care much about the foldability. Um, I don't travel that much where I would need a 3D printer with me. But of course, for that, it is cool. Um, what I find really cool is the, the implication that you're doing kind of the, the right thing, the logical thing. It's like you reinvent the wheel, but the previous wheel was kind of like, well, we... <laughs> came up with this thing we never thought about it much and that's kind of like what what existing 3d printers are like the entire um betzlinger approach um is because that is the way that the sales mendel was built um that's like what what the guys at, at bath um came up with as an alternative to building a darwin which is a huge box that was like the next step and we never moved away from that we never moved on from that so kind of the implication of having a an upside down 3d print and the way that um it was built here is that you're actually you 
you're supporting the parts that move which create dynamic forces you're supporting those the best and then the parts that don't move all that much which is the bed um you can have on a on a cantilever you can have sticking out and that's that's the problem with um with most 3d printers is because it, it moves the hot end up and away from solid ground mm. from from where it's like transferring its forces into the table you've done a lot of stuff about that um with your <laughs> resonance and um two dollar upgrade and, and all that mm. um you're moving the point where those forces are created by slinging the hot and the extruder around you're moving that away from where it's coupled into a solid object and by having that you rely on the entire mechanical s uh, structure of the printer to not ring uh to be rigid so not to flex um and here the hot end and extruder is like all the way down on the table so that that is I think that is a really neat approach. Yeah. Um, besides that, there are even more interesting things behind the printer. I think, and those are, um, for example, the print bed, where he specifically didn't use a just like standard heated bed that you can get with like every cheap 3D printer. He used a sheet of glass and um i think he just uh, i don't know uh was i don't know it, if it's copper film or stuck? like the, the, the same stuff he says it's the same approach yeah. as you would do with a heated uh not windshield, Car window but, yeah rear window yeah so um he wants to have the ability to check the first layer really yeah. to look through that piece of glass and and use that to check on the print because it because the, uh, because the printer is so not high, so shallow, <laughs> um, you would not have a, a proper nice way to take a look at the first and the most important layers of your print. So he just used a piece of glass, um, taped a couple of uh, copper traces on there and had himself um, a heated bed which uh, through which you're able to look through, which is totally cool yeah it's not i mean it's not going to be super even like that's something you can take for granted as long as there's no heat spread heat spread in there and the glass doesn't mm. really do a great job of like really dissipating or spreading out the heat no. from those traces but hey it works like that's that's what comes right it, it does work in this application um the other thing of course is also we're, we're <laughs> gonna add something to the bed well i recently browsed through Nopad's uh, block, um, Hydrapture or something like yeah, that. Such a great and resource. Where, well, the first the first approach is on having a a heated bed for a three D printer that he used for printing ABS on. Was he just strapped a couple of resistors, th those those big resistors under um, an aluminum heated bed or something like that? Yeah, of course you have the aluminum to 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 spread it out, but yeah, the resistors will be the main source of heat, so it wasn't even as well. So I, I think that's even better. And if you don't want to print like nylons or polycarbonates uh, on on such a machine for PLA, if it's between sixty five and fifty five degrees Celsius, yeah, that's totally fine. Yeah, uh, I mean that's that's the exact same that my first heated bed um, was built like we had um you know a couple of ceramic resistors strapped them under a actually under a steel sheet which doesn't do nearly as good of a, of a job of spreading the heat around uh, as aluminum does <laughs> and it, it still worked um we still managed to print abs on that though to be honest you can get quite far if you use the correct surface without a heated bed i mean heated beds were relatively late in the entire 3d printing development stage um PLA you can print onto blue tape, onto uh, acrylic even, um, onto mm. PET, all those things. Uh, we printed ABS onto paper, onto regular copy paper, um, which it does stick really well. It's just tricky to, to get the paper to stick down and to stay flat, but you can yeah. do that. Um, so you hit it bed's late stage development, and I think with, well... It's it's just a development of, of we having the entire 3D printing process better under control. We, we have more precise control over extruders even. I mean, the first extruders were just a gear motor, a DC gear motor that didn't have any any retract, <laughs> any ability to retract. Uh, even I think that the first one didn't even have a, an ability to turn off. It was just, well, you, you turn on the extruder and it keeps feeding filament and 
You know, if it slows down, <laughs> it slows down. You're under extruding for a bit. It, it works. <laughs> Stepper extruders were also pretty late. Um, so yeah, you, you can get away with a lot of stuff. The other interesting thing, of course, here is overhangs. And well, not overhangs. Well, overhangs too, I guess, but bridging. Bridging particularly. Mm -hmm. um, it's interesting that the bridges don't look significantly different to what a bridge would look like on a um, on a right side up printer, right? You still yeah. have that that bow through, and and if it's upside down, it's actually bowing up. And that's because yeah. the extruder is like physically pushing the filament through that bridge <laughs> layer, and it's uh, yeah. uh, it's pushing that up. Of course, you don't get you know when when you have a stray bridging strand, if you have that strand break, it doesn't drop down it drops up and then yeah. potentially gets ironed over by the extruder again so that that would make yeah. it cleaner but yeah there well there weren't any significant uh, differences and i have also already strapped a printer to i don't know the roof of of my basement and and tried it out and thought it was like the new big thing just printing upside down with a delta printer it's totally easy because you can usually just put those things uh, uh on their top yeah. but yeah it, it doesn't make a huge difference um i guess as long as cooling's good enough or well there's i think even with with other materials where you don't use that much cooling still if you're doing bridges a bit of tension in the filament that you extrude and that helps you to kind of stretch that piece of filament from yeah. like the starting to the end point belt strength is something you, that you do need so it, it really depends yeah. a lot on, on the filament itself yeah, yeah but but for the printer uh, great design great yeah. design uh, of course I, there's, I guess there's a note in the description do not build for reference only please wait for positron 2.0 so <laughs> you can download the files you can look at them but like it's it's a first uh design which is something that as a as a youtube person you often do you, you make something you produce a video on it and it's it's version one that you show i admire ivan miranda in that way because crap, yeah. he often iterates on his designs and usually for his designs especially his last like not cnc router like his cnc mill which yeah. i definitely have to build at the end of this year when i have more time Ooh. are you um, gonna have the space for that it's not that big it's it's really not that big well well also space for like you're gonna have metal chips flying around I have I have a basement shop. I have a lathe in there. I, I yeah. do my wood CNC routing in there. I guess that's gonna be fine. Okay. okay. <laughs> I don't know my, how my uh, um, my solar inverter is gonna like small chips that are flying through the air. But I have to maybe shield that a little and also my network system, which is just below that. Yeah, and inverters are typically like IP something. They're water. Yeah. Rain tight. Not, not water tight. Rain tight. Yeah. Rain tight and chip tight. Um, no, what I really admire is that he always takes the effort and puts out the plans for his design. Well, not always, but he, he does that very often. He charges, I think, 25, 20 bucks for that, which I find is, is totally reasonable if he takes the time and, and just, yeah, writes everything down and, it's not going to be a manual as as detailed as like building a push up printer or something like that but Obviously. it's a way better starting point than just having a cat model and maybe a video on that because you have a bill of material you have basically good instructions and if you want to divert from that it's it's going to be easier yeah selling selling plans i mean that's a that's a good topic it's something that um, woodworking channels very often do. Um, I know that um, a lot of the, a lot of channels make a significant amount of their income from selling plans as you know sponsors and and ad spots on YouTube isn't really something you you might be able to survive on. So selling plans is something that you, you can you can add to that. Should we start selling plans for stuff? So I, I like the 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 auto changer on the on the war and like I, I'm I'm always going like well. I'm just going to throw it out there. I'm just going to provide a 
like a, a zero effort CAD export, basically have a pub. I, sh uh, I think I still need to publish this, but um, I always throw it out there, go like, hey, it's public domain. Um, you know, I'm not gonna like put a whole lot of effort. I'm not gonna spend three days uh, doing all the documentation on it. You saw the video if you wanna build one and if you can figure it out from the video, then you're probably qualified to build one. If, if having the video is not enough for you, then you probably shouldn't attempt it because it is it is still quite uh, quite rough around the edges but i don't know maybe, maybe that's, that's something for, for you guys watching and listening um would you be interested in seeing uh like fully fleshed out plans for uh, the auto bed changer uh, with build instructions uh, or for the uh, infidel the filament diameter sensor or um Stephen, your, your my your... universal test machine exactly exactly i'm gonna be i'm gonna uh, I've had the parts for over a year now. <laughs> uh, I'll be building one as well with it with a uh, you know large load cell as well. Um, stuff like that. Though honestly, I, I I would feel bad charging for for stuff like that. Um, but the thing is, um, what is mere? Oh, what is mere? What what is more beneficial? Just having like the rough plans and and a YouTube video online or having someone taking the time and writing a proper manual that makes it easier to start and easier to source and well charge a non-significant amount of money for that effort that you put into that um does that already mean that you're putting your design behind a paywall yeah does that already mean that yeah, do, yeah. You, do you just put the manual behind a, a paywall and say here's the here's the CAD model? Uh, you go, you can either go figure it out yourself, or you can pay me to to get the the full documentation no. with it. Could you still say that it's open source if you open source the design files, but not the manual? Uh, open source excludes one specific uh, adjective, and that is free. So free open source and open source are two separate things. Um, just because something is open source doesn't mean it's free. You can still charge for open source software. Um, it's just then, you know, the, the user has, you have the obligation to provide the user with the source code that they then can freely share. So yeah, there's no obligation to, to provide an open source design for free. Yeah. I think maybe it it would be a feasible way to go the route that you just suggested releasing cat files and the video and whoever wants to get more information can pay 10 15 20 bucks for for a manual where everything is properly documented i would it be worth the effort would people actually want that um of course it would be i mean since we both have patrons that would be something that that would just be included yeah. on a patron perk of course um, yeah but. I would think since since Ivan regularly does that for all of his designs and he also is is living from his YouTube business it's worth his time and effort um creating that manual and and selling that and as I said he he's selling that he's selling his things usually between like 10 to 25 euros this is nothing like yeah you have to pay 100 bucks for the plans yeah, there is there is, is quite totally a usable. there is quite a stretch in, in how much plans are worth. Like kind of woodworking stuff. I think um, Bob from I like to make stuff um, usually charges like five bucks for for a set of plans. Um, mm. Then you've got the the mid range, and then you've got uh, four eyes. Yes, four eyes. I think their plans are, are more like a hundred bucks. Um, but they also yeah. produce a full um, video tutorial series, basically with like two hours yeah. of, of edited video footage. Um, for building the entire thing with like, okay, here's here's how you place your, I don't know, here's how you use the tool to to, to mm. make it. Um, so yeah, maybe, maybe something to consider. Um, Would this be something that could be a, a Patreon perk? Yeah, I, I just said that. Yeah, it would obviously be either you buy it straight up or you get it through a patreon perk like that's obvious yeah. and I, I think that's that's my my main point of of contention is like you know when somebody's already supporting a channel out of their free aus freien stücken um out of their free will uh on patreon and they're just saying hey i love what you do here is i don't know five or 20 bucks a month um and then you're saying well you know, thanks for that but i'm still gonna charge you for for the for the stuff that i do 
that kind of feels wrong. So I, I feel like it wouldn't need to be um, part of a Patreon perk, of course. Yeah. We'll see. Definitely. We'll see. I'll, I'll think about it. And and please, guys, yeah. uh, let us know in... How can people comment if they're listening? Twitter, right? Tweet at us. At the Milton. Twitter. Or, or at Tom's 3DP. Um, or, you know, at CNC Kitchen. Uh, if you have an opinion about that. Cool. So, next topic. 3D print colorizer. Yes. Also, oh, open source project. Uh, multicolor 3D printing without a multicolor 3D printer and without a mixing nozzle, without a multiplexer, without any of that having to, to deal with different uh, different filaments, different filament spools, stuff like that. Uh, so good. And pretty easy and straightforward. Yeah. So, very, like, like I said, very straightforward and just the, the the way the way that it's built, the way that it's using what you have is is kind of remi- uh, rem- reminiscent of the what was the Japanese project we had where it was like it slices uh, ham yeah. and it makes you a sandwich. Kind of yeah. reminds me of of that. So, um, what it is is basically it, t- it grabs a sharpie from a from a rack of sharpies that's up on your printer. Um, that it's that sharpie is attached to the printer's tool head and it then uses that sharpie to color in the layers uh, or each layer um that the that the regular tool head has just printed and from what you get it's i mean this uh, honestly this looks better than a multicolor multi-filament print um because that the colors are that they're they're a bit silky they they have a bit of subsurface scattering mm-hmm. uh they have depth to them uh it's nice, and I guess it's faster than doing uh, multi-nozzle printing as well. Could be, if you have like swap cycles or tool chain cycles um, with heat up and cool down times. I've got the the Sigma D25 behind me right now. Yeah. Um, ha ha. Um, just swapped cameras. Uh, so <laughs> I've I've got that behind me, and that. I think that is the best approach to doing, aside from tool changes maybe, but that is the one of the best approaches to doing multi-tool head printing. And it's it still is slow because you have swap over times. Um, you mean an IDEX system? Yes, yes. So okay. two, two independent extruders, X-axes. Um, it still has swap over times. You still need to prime the hot ends. Um, it even prints a, a, a priming tower. Like the, the software setup on this thing is, well, it's not very good. Um, but yeah the colorizer just also you're not limited to to what uh to what color filaments you have so no this is you only this... need white filament you can buy like a an assortment of 50 exactly. different sharpie colors and then just well load basically the uh the colors that um are well you, you need for your project and he shows that on his Endo 3, so uh, 150 euros 3D printer, dollars, money units, whatever, um, you print just the small rack holder for the pens. You add a small holder, holder that is attached to the tool head and you are good to go so this is so this upgrade would cost you well without the sharpies maybe two euros on 3d printed parts <laughs> exactly and you have a multicolor 3d printer which is yeah. really really nice so what um how was his name uh sakati, sakati 84. 84 yeah uh is providing on his github is not only the 3d printed files because Again, uh, just like the mecha- mechanical construction is really easy. Um, he is also providing a Cura plugin that is used to modify the G code in a way that already, that at first you only print a layer in your white filament and then the tool change cycle comes where you pick up the new color and then you, well, color that layer and proceed with normal printing. Yeah. And the way that you prepare your files is basically you have the same sort of setup as with a multi-material print. 
um, or multicolor print where you have your STL basically split into, or your 3MF in uh, preferred way, mm. uh, split into different areas um, where the, the actual 3D model is split. And uh, you just assign those to the different uh, color slots in uh, of, of the Sharpies that you've loaded. So it, it looks, to cure, it looks like you've got a completely... Which actually makes sense. Like it, it just runs a uh, an extruder swap cycle, um, mm-hmm. and yeah, to to cure it just looks like you have five or well five in this case uh, extruders. And yeah, I mean software wise, it's really elegant too. Yeah, I would be curious um, how it manages to. Well, he basically needs to reprint every layer. I guess he's only colorizing the perimeters of the print and not the infill but he basically needs to redo a couple of printing well printing steps he already did with like a normal filament and do the same tool path with the tool offset with the sharpie i guess that's what the what the cure plugin does yeah, um, I mean, you, you could say Cura, Cura probably internally does do variable layer height, so you could just have like one zero point two millimeter layer and then mm-hmm. a zero point zero 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 one layer on top of that. That is yep. in the the Sharpie pass. Yep. Um, so yeah, there's there's a plugin for um, that. Big question: uh, Will it hurt layer adhesion? <laughs> I, I think somebody even sent me an email asking that because Teaching Tech released a video on that yeah. uh, 3D print colorizer. So if you guys are interested, definitely check that out. He goes into way more details how it worked for him and might get you a better starting point than just taking a look at the at the GitHub. But uh, yeah, I think one of the questions that came up is would the Sharpie color be bad for the layer adhesion of your print? I guess it depends on what sort of, of marker you use and how exactly that's that's made up. Um, of course, if you use a grease pen, um, and that will <laughs> that will hurt layer adhesion a lot. But I don't think using a sharpie would matter all that much because it's it, the sharpies, especially, are solvent based uh, paints. Um, it might even I mean, if with with ABS, if it if it slightly dissolves the layer, it might even help layer adhesion. Who knows? This is actually this is actually the the idea that I had in mind. I think if you just add a layer of paint um, on your part, I think that might have a negative impact on the layer adhesion. But I was thinking, what would happen if you have a marker in your printer that, for example, just like rubs with acetone over each layer and slightly yeah. dissolves it or maybe just roughs it up a little bit yeah probably would be really interesting to, to to try out yeah i mean possibly if it's still got acetone in there uh dissolved into the material it's probably gonna cause some issues with bubbling and boiling but <laughs> interesting idea yeah the, the sharpies yeah. so the sharpies as far as i'm aware they're, they're just a dye dissolved in uh in solvent and by the time that the nozzle passes over that should have evaporated if you've got mm-hmm. something like a um like an actual paint um such as yeah these guys um this is like a silver mark anywhere paint or, or marker um that i used to mark my 3d prints because it's an opaque color um those would most likely hurt adhesion uh, because yeah. it's literally it is literally a solvent based paint uh, in a pen um but yeah. sharpies i don't i don't think is much of an issue <coughs> so might be worth trying out yeah um also one one cool thing how you know I, i've built i've built one of those pen plotters before that has like the the spring suspended or rubber band suspended sharpie in there or some sort of a pen um mm-hmm. to do pcb etching um but because this approach of just coloring in the layers doesn't really need all that much precision i guess first of all it is pretty white tip sharpies and also there's no tensioner for the sharpie the sharpie just has its own weight gravity basically um mm-hmm. pushing down on the tip and that is enough so you don't need any complicated assemb- excuse me any complicated assembly there it's just the sharpie sitting in that um in that holder and, it, and its own weight presses down so very elegant approach yeah oh and I'm just all seeing right that one. okay okay 
<laughs> should we do should we round this one out with a comment from Lundev? Because I know your 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 yes. time your time is short, so we're we're skipping a couple topics today. But Stefan's on vacation and he, he deserves that. Yeah. Um so uh, I'm gonna be back in a bit. Yeah. I mean you're you're still on, on parental leave, so we're gonna have all the time <laughs> we want. I'm I'm actually not yet on parental leave. My parental my two weeks of parental leave start tomorrow. <laughs> oh. I'm still on normal vacation. Okay. Oh well, same. <laughs> uh, not. I, I guess if if you say same thing, it's it's not really the same thing because parental leave really yeah. is supposed to be hey you're there for your offspring and for your uh, for your partner to, to support them. So vacation is really meant to take time off. And but anyways, <laughs> um, comment from from Lundev about the um, what we basically refer to as reverse engineering support feature from or I refer to it as as that um, from Autodesk Confusion 360. The what, what is it officially called, Stefan? I don't have Fusion on on my laptop okay. right here. It is yes, called the um, STL no mesh mesh to solid conversion. Okay. So, a comment about the Mesh to Solid conversion um, by Lundev. So, uh, first comment is it's also available in the student license. And the student license is different from the maker license, right? Might be more fully yes, featured. It, yeah, exactly. So, so Autodesk is... <sighs> gives, gives their licenses quite freely avail away for students. So, I knew that when I was was still in university um, you could just make an account with your university email, email address and you basically have access to even yeah. all, all of their professional products so the student license is usually way more featured than the than the uh, maker and yeah the private license yeah. so this is a good thing if you are a student you can still try out the conversion from an STL model to a solid model in Fusion 360, only if you're currently on the maker version and the unpaid maker version, um, it is unfortunately not available for you. So thanks for the correction or the hint there. Yeah, uh, I was I was gonna say uh, I was I was thinking we we're gonna say. Uh, <sighs> I mean, start over. I, I was thinking we we're going to say, well, thanks Autodesk for making that available uh, in the student <laughs> license. The thing is, student licenses, they, they really, they're the free trial. Um, they're the free trial to get students hooked on this one specific tool. And then once they move out to the industry, they're like, well, but I know Fusion or I know SolidWorks in my case. <laughs> um, university was, was doing SolidWorks. And uh, I know that. Like, could, could we use that maybe? And then, of course, you're paying for the, for the full industry yeah. license and that's where they make the money they, they just get you hooked with those student licenses um autodesk is giving away the gateway drug for free it, it is exactly that <laughs> yeah um and then london is also commenting well he tried it with a he she uh tried it with a photogrammetric scan with a photogrammetry scan and it didn't work Maybe some cleanup on the STL needed beforehand. And Stephanie, you, you commented that it's not really intended, perhaps, as a reverse engineering from a scan. Perhaps. So place. as far as I have understood it, this tool is working quite well for STLs that were already generated from um, yeah a solid model. Because then you have really nice defined flat surfaces you have nicely defined uh, fillets and chamfers and everything but if you have a 3d scan coming from photogrammetry or or any other 3d scanning method those have usually quite a bit of um roughness and and yeah so the yeah. roughness yeah so they're, they're not they're not 100 percent accurate so flat surfaces aren't going to yeah. be flat and also the vertices yeah. are not going to be properly aligned that's something that i know um 3d artists struggle a lot with yeah yeah okay that is, that is maybe a good point because yeah <laughs> go ahead <laughs> well you, you, your internet seems to have quite a bit of lag that, that makes it that makes it hard to record um but yeah so, sorry for, for talking into you the so the the um what was it? Yeah, vertices. Um, 
a nice export like it's gonna have the the edge of vertices aligned to like if you have a nice round over there it's gonna be a, str a nice edge and then the vertices are gonna be aligned ar around that edge a flat surface is gonna have a nice edge uh, around that and then the vertices inside that are gonna be nicely grouped like if you look at the preview mm -hmm. um of an stl or 3mf export in fusion that's usually what you get a 3d scan on the other hand is just gonna be pff, you know randomly positioned oriented uh, vertices vertices as in like the basic 3d triangle yeah. that stls and, and other uh surface no surface models not but yeah stls are made of um and those are something that are much harder to work with because they have no clean um, boundary that you can define um they might be stretched in weird ways that gets you, you weird deformations um there is the ability i know it is in it is available in blender um that you can redefine like clean edges that you say okay i would like this line um retopograph topology retopo um i would like this line to be a clean edge i would like this line to be a clean edge and then it basically creates a a mesh that is approximately the same or approximately similar to your previous mesh but now has those edges aligned and all the surfaces are a lot cleaner. So that is something if you're familiar with Blender or if you're if, if you know Blender, um, if you know how to work with Blender, I, I guess I should say. That is something that you could try before um, putting a model into Fusion and converting it into or trying to convert it into solid. Exactly. So there are specific 3D scan reverse engineering softwares available that are exactly designed for that task which help you to to identify specific features and where you can for example just click on a part of a surface where you say okay this is going to be a cylinder in the end in the end and the software is automatically going to uh, fit a cylinder in there um the tool in fusion 360s is is i think not primarily meant for that if you want to do that you can either just use the three scan as, as a blueprint and then just design over it with a standard uh, geometry in fusion 360 for example um there is even so what i already i also already did in the past fusion 360 has um there is uh, how is that so you have the the normal solid construction you have the sheet metal construction and then there's also one surface toolbox infusion surface where you can create those really nice bionic bionic surfaces polynerve structures whatever um this tool for example has the possibility where you can just well define a surface somewhere and you say okay i, I want to intersect that surface in i don't know like basically a checkerboard pattern and then you can say okay project okay. all of those points onto my 3d scan or my my stl geometry and that can could also help you but if you want to go really a way forward uh, and what is for example often done when a new car model is released so there are companies that buy like the newest cars really disassemble uh, disassemble them to to the last piece that is available 3d scan and reverse engineer all all of those parts uh and then to 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 sell those files and there's specific uh tools to do that i can't remember the name of the one uh, i have already used in the past but way more powerful for something like that but usually not something the maker is worried about okay and i think that is a good time to call it because Stefan, you are breaking up pretty badly um yeah, if you want to check out one of those uh, reverse engineering companies, um, Munro Live on YouTube talks about a lot of the stuff they figure out um, with their reverse engineering uh, trials. So if you're interested in that, uh, go check them out. I think they just disassembled a uh, Ford Mark E. I guess Mustang Mark E. Um, right. So, Stefan, thank you for taking the time out of your vacation for recording this podcast. I'm happy to do that. <laughs> Thank you for your time. Sure thing. Well, it's just a regular Thursday for me. <laughs> all right. Thank you all for watching and listening as well. If you want to support us, uh, you can do so either on Stefan's Patreon or on mine. Uh, we don't have YouTube memberships on this channel, but on our YouTube channels as well. Uh, you can subscribe on YouTube. You can subscribe and listen on any 
podcasting platform as well. If you're listening on YouTube or watching on YouTube and would, would rather listen, that is an option too. Um, yeah, thanks for that. Thank you, Stefan, again. And have a, have you, Stefan, have a nice vacation. You guys have a great week. And we will hear and see you in the next one. Bye. Bye.